This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking engine revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With hundreds of athletes, entrepreneurs, speakers, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent for your next event. For more information, please visit letsengage.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigarian. I'm so honored to have with us today my longtime friend and great human being, Scott Silverman. Welcome to the Impact, Scott. John, thanks so much. And anytime somebody calls me a great human being, I feel like next time we physically connect, I got to buy you a cup of coffee. Well, either that or we're going to at least give each other a big hug because hopefully it's after we get through this COVID crisis. It'll be just nice to hug people again. Well, if you want to hug me, you got to keep your mask on, brother. No problem. No problem at all. That's no problem at all. You know, uh, I, I want to get into all the important work you're doing um, as a crisis coach, a family navigator, um, the owner and entrepreneur of yourcrisiscoach.com. Before we do that, though, Scott, I want you to share a little bit about your backstory in your own words. I know your backstory. It's fascinating. It's important for our listeners to hear it from your own voice. You know, thanks, Donna. And, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll be brief about that because I, I, really, I really want to bring it forward to what's going on today. And I'm yeah. happy to do that because I know people who don't, don't know me. And the easy way to get to know me is, you know, uh, my name is Scott H. Silverman. Just Google me and you'll find out everything you want to know. And I'm one of those kind of guys. I'm going to give my phone number out right now, John, if you don't mind. No, go ahead. It's uh, 619-993-2738. 619-993-2738. Nine nine three two seven three, and I dare people to call me. And I, I'm one of those people. If I get an unusual, unknown name in my phone, I pick it up because it's a way for me to try to help a family get one of their loved ones into treatment. So let's go back. So you know, you and I met by the way when I was running a nonprofit, working uh, with yep. people coming out of jail and prison. And yeah. uh, you know, you were you're in the recycling business, and, and I was in the upcycling business with people. Mm. And we had a we had a great conversation around that, and yeah. uh, it's it's been something I'll never forget. So thanks to for today day and the opportunity. So growing up, you know, traditional family, uh, I was in a retail clothing business, one of four kids and parents who worked all the time. And I was just one of those kids that got in trouble periodically. And then I got involved with uh, mood altering substances and self-medicating. And then it grew to, you know, uh, substance abuse and alcohol and, you know, crashed and burned and eventually decided I was tired of living and tried to end my own life. And luckily I had, there was divine mm-hmm. intervention there. And, uh, luckily I got into treatment. I had, uh, my, my wife who we only been married two years. So she saw the worst of it and she was willing to stand by my side and, and help me get through what I needed to went to treatment. And that was back in, uh, gosh, back in 1984 in November. Wow. So, and I've been clean and sober now for a little over, um, 35 years. So I, I really appreciate, you know, every day that I have and I do whatever I can to help others. So once I got sober, my whole world changed. And once it changed, um, Mm -hmm. there was no looking back. And I've been lucky and I've been fortunate. And now I spend every waking moment I have working with others. And once I left the family business, it was recommended. I started over. I was on state folk rehab, a disability for a couple of years, trying to figure out what to do in the housing business. And then started a nonprofit and worked with people who... uh, you know, had barriers and non-traditional working paths, just like me. Mm -hmm. And I did that for decades and left that business about 10 years ago. And seven years ago, I don't know why, it was just a calling, I guess. I, uh, with a guy who just started this uh, outpatient substance abuse treatment programs called Confidential Recovery, wanted to work with first responders. And we did. And that's kind of how Confidential got started. Then I, I grew my crisis coaching business simply because, you know, so much of what happens with treatment is a family member calls and says, you know, I have a loved one, I have a significant other, I have a son, I have a daughter, an uncle, um, or a neighbor or a coworker or a colleague. And what I did was I used my own personal experience, you know, with the nonprofit and working with people who've, you know, defined as the community throwaways at running a homeless agency. I got a lot of experience dealing with all kinds of different levels of people with needs. And I tried to, to, to do things in a way that was out of the box thinking uh, because traditionally in the social service world, they want to keep their job, if you will, by keeping the people in front of them in, in some sort of a 
framework of need, which is interesting because that's kind of why I started my nonprofit. I met with social service providers and they said, well, you know, Scott, if you're successful and you get our clients jobs, what will we do? And my answer was, well, get a job. <laughs> so <laughs> I've always kind of fought the system and, and I'm still doing it that way. You know, now I'm working in a credentialed facility. We take insurance, but the crisis coaching piece is what I'm really passionate about. You know, you have a friend that wants to call me and we talk and then, you know, if they want to hire me, great. If they don't, you know, I give people free 20, 30 minute coaching and then we figure out what's best. And the cool thing about, you know, today with Zoom and the working off of, you know, the internet, I can coach people anywhere and with Skype and Zoom and the phone itself. So that's uh, what I'm talking about more and more today. That's how I created my own podcast. It's actually called Scott H. Silver and Happy Hour. John, we're going to get you on that before the end of the year. <laughs> no problem. Well. And, I, and I called that happy hour because that was when my favorite time was when I was drinking was at the end of the day when I was finished with my cocaine and methamphetamine so I could kind of mellow out and go home, smoke a joint and go to sleep. And that was kind of how my life was, 100 hours a week working and 80 hours a week uh, under the influence until I turned 30 and 66 now. So clearly... I like to believe what I'm doing is working, and, and I want to try to give as much of it away as I possibly can and help others. Your work is so important. You know, Scott, your yep. work is so important. You're a recovery OG, and um, and that's why I, it was real important when I relaunched my podcast to have you on, because this is still not being covered. As you know, I'm also in recovery, not an OG like you are, but OG enough that, um, again, I see the stigma. Talk a little bit about the stigma. You know, the shame of asking for help and raising your hand. You know, now that so many celebrities have come out uh, with issues re around drug addiction and all sorts of other types of uh, addiction issues, is the stigma still there or has it started to come off or are we still living under that huge cloud trying to find, you know, trying to get people to raise their hand and reach out to great people like you? Well, well let me, I'm going to answer that question a, a different way. First okay. of all, in because I, because I, as an SME and the, and I've just, you know, there's so much data out there and I've pretty much like the old, you know, the Hoover syndrome, I've sucked it all up. So right now, <laughs> the way the science goes, 15% of our country yeah. has an active addiction issue that will erupt in the next 12 months, 15%. Oh boy. But what's even more staggering to me is of the 15%, I was one of them each day that they're either under the influence or coming off of a night of being under the influence they negatively impact seven people. So if you add up the seven people plus the 15%, that means 85% of our country right now mm. is going to be negatively impacted either by the person who's under the influence or if you're coming in contact with them. And I'm talking a family member, a coworker, someone on the road who's impaired or someone who's running your business or working with you or they're responsible for something or you know, a teacher or a lawyer or a doctor under the influence, they're going to have a negative impact on at seven people if they're ones under the influence. Hmm. So to answer your direct question about stigma, yeah. is it, it's, you know, it's probably improved to some degree, but you know, let, let me back up. I'm sorry. The, the percentage figure I want to use and throw at you. And the reason for that is right now it's a $40 billion industry, 40 billion hmm. that people are spending, insurance companies are spending to provide treatment for individuals. The outcome of that treatment, the average person who will spend 28 days in a substance abuse treatment program or substance use uh, abuse program. If all they do is the 28-day program, I don't care where it is and how much it costs, if that's all they do, according to science, 95% of those will relapse within 90 days to six months, 95%. So can you imagine a business that has a 95% failure rate? I mean, it's like, so when you think about it, there's a lot of discouraged families out there. Number one, that contributes to stigma. Secondly, you know, it's a shame-based oriented, unfortunately, a disease. But when you look at the disease of addiction, and I call it a disease, and you liken it to something like, you know, um, the, the, the wording that I really want is, you know, diabetes. Mm. Diabetes is a disease. And, you know, once you get diagnosed and you get a form of treatment and you're, you know, checking your blood sugar level every day and you're putting insulin in your body, those are tools in your recovery plan. You can live a very long time. And the same thing with, with substance abuse issues. But for some reason, people are shamed when they have the issue. And if they raise their hand and talk about, hey, I need help, 
um, what happens is people feel they feel like they're either going to either be judged or they aren't judged because people think it's a moral failing. Meaning, if you don't pick up that drink, John, you won't have a drinking problem. Well, that doesn't work for a guy like me. If I pick right. up the drink and I take the drink, I'm going to want another one and I'm going to want another one. And that's part of the disease. My brain is just wired that way. So, yes, it's helped a lot that you see some of these, you know, movie stars come out, you know, and uh, was Eminem just recently publicly stated he'd got 12 years and you know, Robert Downey Jr., he's got one of the best phrases. He said, every time I did cocaine, I broke out in handcuffs. So, you know, they, <laughs> they, they're, they're talking about it in a way they never have before. But on the other hand, the level of that celebrity it also is expiring in, in many ways at a, at a much higher rate, the morbidity rate right now for, mm. for people. First of all, they're much younger. And second of all, you know, they have all these great things happening for them. But, you know, it's interesting. The science says that the disease of addiction – Success is as much, if not a bigger barrier than failure, because failure is familiar, it's like an old sweater. So, mm. you know, I don't think we've done much. Uh, we haven't done enough, let me put it that way, with stigma. And, you know, when you think about the opioid crisis that we've had over the last 12 or 15 years and really accelerated the last five or six so many people, you know, were getting have gotten to the point where they've gotten on prescription medication now. You know, opioids a little bit more for pain, but you know, how many people are taking medication right now in, in this in this country? You know, we're a we're a pill oriented consumer, and we, you know, what five percent of the population? We have eighty percent of the medication for dealing with stress, anxiety, depression, uh, you know, sleep deprivation, and just coping skills. And I think it's something like fifteen percent or twenty percent of our children. Young kids are on, you know, some form of something like Adderall or something n near to it. So we are a pill-oriented society. So that contributes to it to, as well. And I think what happens is families are concerned, but the addict themselves don't think they have a problem. I mean, look at these kids right now in their 20s that are going to these, they call them Skittle parties. They go to these parties. Everybody brings their favorite self-medicating uh, pill and they put it into a bowl and at a certain time of the night or morning, everyone stops, goes to the bowl and grabs something. Oh my and God. there's, there's, there's counterfeit medication that's going in these things. There's Xanax going in this Percocet, Valium, Oxycontin. And, and a lot of it right now is whacked with heroin and or fentanyl. So we're seeing kids overdose, you know, mid to late teens and early twenties, like we've never seen before. So and some of that obviously is accidental, but there's a lot of kids that are self-medicating because they just can't process. And they, you know, now with marijuana, you know, we're in California. So as you know, marijuana became legal two years ago now. And the, the potency content of that is 28 times greater when I was smoking it back in the 70s. Wow. So when you think about that, and of course that keeps the brain from developing. And when mm. you're 15 to 25, if you're you know putting that kind of self-medication in your body, your brain doesn't develop and your maturation rate doesn't develop. So, and families have to make a decision. We're going to let Johnny smoke dope and live at home, or we're going to have to kick him out and make him homeless. So they get to that, you know, impending doom and they're not sure what to do. So that's where my crisis coaching and family navigating has really been an opportunity because I'm not a therapist. I'm not a clinician, I'm not a doctor, you know, and I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a cop. So I'm just a guy with a lot of experience. So I kind of come at this in a different way. But what's funny when I sit in the rooms, like I'm on the prescription drug abuse task force, I'm on the methamphetamine task force. And I'm one of the few people in the room who I used to call myself an unlicensed pharmacist. You know, I'm retired now. My daughter says, you have to say you're retired, <laughs> uh, you know, unlicensed pharmacist. So when I come to the rooms and I sit at these meetings, I bring a level of efficacy that's a little different than some of them. And not the you know, there's a county people, but these are meetings with criminal justice, the DA, the U.S. attorney, the medical examiner. I mean, these are the people I hang out with now because they're the ones who are dealing with, you know, the spillage right now and the overdosing that's going on. We just had, I was on a Zoom meeting yesterday and I heard there were mm -hmm. three more young people that died in our community over the weekend at one of these events. They go to these parties and people mm. are making counterfeit medication, making it look like Xanax mm. or Percocets or Valiums or even Oxy. But what they're getting is it's cut with fentanyl and fentanyl is so deadly oh. and it's really killing so many people. But I, I don't even know if that answers your stigma question, but I do know this. That if we as a country, you know, we're losing about 170 people a day right now to mm. overdoses. Last year, I think it was north of this. The claim was 2019, 
72,000 plus, which is more people actually than died in Vietnam. And, you know, right now, obviously, with this COVID uh, situation, many people are home and alcohol consumption or sales are up 60 percent. Fentanyl overdoses are way up. Methamphetamine distribution is wider than ever. The dark web, you know, you can buy anything on the dark web and you have it shipped to you through the post office. So excess to medication is greater than we've ever seen before. Did you? I never heard, and you know, and I follow the recovery industry quite quite a lot. I never heard the term crisis coach before. Was that a, a, a term you coined yourself, or something that was already out there, or did you normalize it? Well, you know, I, I'd like to think that I, I've been using it a long time because I, you know, life coach just didn't fit for me. I, you know, right. You know. You know I, I, so and, and that became a really big thing, I think, you know, about 15 years ago. And I like the idea of crisis. But then what happens is, is when people kind of, you know, embrace the term crisis, it's almost like, you know, I, you know, this disease of addiction is the disease of denial, the inability to feel feelings. Mm. So it wasn't a great messaging. So I, I really shifted over to family navigator. So I call myself crisis coach, family navigator, because that's really what I'm doing. I mean, I run an outpatient program, but you know, people need a higher level of care. What I do is I help them get into detox. I refer them over to residential treatment. I make sure that if they, you know, if all they really needed maybe is to check in with an addiction psychiatrist, I try to make the appropriate referral because outpatient's more the back end. And the reason I wanted to do outpatient was I believe there's treatment and there's recovery. And treatment is when you get stabilized, you go through the detox and recovery to me is what, you know, what we do the rest of our life. So that's why I like the idea of the outpatient piece. And I chose first responders because I just, you know, I used to work with people coming out of jail and prison. As you know, you, you came and visited and, you know, I, that was not a population I wanted to serve now. So I figured now I'm helping the people used to arrest my old clients. So it's an interesting, you know. 360. Right. But, but at the end of the day, you know, we're working mostly with professionals and I'm, you know, we're talking doctors and lawyers, law enforcement says law enforcement is North of 25%. That is <sighs> their alcohol and self-medication outcomes. That's their data. So oh when you gosh. see four cops standing on a corner, according to science, one of them has a potential problem that will erupt this year. The, the American Bar Association self disclosed that 3% of the lawyers in our country have an alcohol abuse problem. And, you know, you've been in business a long time, John. Mm. You know, if someone's disclosing something like that, it's probably a lot higher. Oh, so, much. Yeah. And it's funny how it got disclosed. They were here at a conference a couple of years ago, and <laughs> there was a, someone from the media in the room, and they, they were talking about you know, how we have to take care of our brothers and sisters and the bar association because you can't walk into a courtroom drunk. It doesn't really look too good, <laughs> and it's really hard to perform when you're under the influence. And if you're talking about saving somebody's life, same thing with doctors. They really don't even – that statistic is interesting because I can't seem to get that one. But, of course, they've been – you know, the AMA is very, very closed about that. And when a doctor gets in trouble – I mean, there was a doctor up in Orange County that was uh, overselling Oxycontin. It took the, the DA's office almost three years to prosecute. It was a woman. Prosecutor. Three years. And they oh knew God. that she was writing dirty scripts all that time and probably a decade before. So the criminal justice system, unfortunately, and I don't think this is a criminal justice problem. I think this is a holistic issue, just like diabetes. We have to help people. We have to let them know there is hope and help. And we have to let them know that treatment works. We have to let them know that it's okay. Those three magic words, hardest to say, I need help. You know, Scott, for our li- for our listeners who just joined us, I've got Scott Silverman, longtime friend, just uh, doing very important work. You need to hear his message today. You could go to his website, yourcrisiscoach.com, yourcrisiscoach.com. What phone number can they reach you at, Scott? They can call or text me anytime, John, at 619-993-2738. Mm. Mm. You know, and I hear from people, hey, yeah. I'm in New York, you're in California. You know what? You text me anytime because when I go to bed, I put my phone in another room because a lot of tweakers tend to call me between midnight (laughs) and five in the morning. You know, (laughs) they were all old, old colleagues of mine. So call and text me anytime, 619-993-273, and I will help 
you mm. answer some of the questions that you may have about, you know, I'm sitting here in a smaller rural area and so and so, what do I do? There's tons of information online right now that people can get. There's Zoom meetings you can go to for recovery. There are crisis hotlines across the country you can call, you know, suicide hotlines right now. There's people answering phones like never before. And part of the reason, the good news about the behavioral health, mental health support coming up is because of COVID. We're seeing mm. suicide rates skyrocketing right now in our country. And it's just, it's, it's off the charts. And you know what? Mm. When you look at a traditional Newsweek, you're not hearing about an overdose anymore. No. It, there's too much, too much other things going on right That's now, right. different efforts and the crisis we have going on in general in our country. And then, of course, being an election year, what's going on with all that stuff at leadership level and, you know, Black Lives Matter and what's happening with all of that. And, you know, people are overwhelmed right now, especially if they're at home. And they're watching the news and, and we're going to see watch and mark my words in the next three years, mm. we're going to see a level of PTSD that we've never seen before in this country, because people who are bringing this stuff in their in their head and their heart don't know how to process it. It's the average person doesn't know how to do it. I mean, we're just starting, just took me a year and a half to get the, uh, prepared and we're ready. We're now in network. We're going to be serving veterans now. And, you know, and veterans mm. in, in our community, San Diego is the third largest city in the country of a veteran population. And mm. I just was told last week, there's 270,000 veterans in San Diego and half of them don't even have the appropriate level of insurance to get help. <laughs> and most people who suffer from PTSD, most people have a substance abuse issue because the only way they, they, they feel better is when they self-medicate. This is tragic that we're leaving and, people. Unless they're, unless they're seeing a professional and they're working through it. But if half of them don't have insurance, you know, you can't go to the library and look up how to feel. You can look up how to feel better, you know, and there's a lot of people in the recovery community who aren't able to go to meetings anymore. And I see them on the zoom meetings and I, you know, I have a colleague who's a psychiatrist and he lost four of his friends locally in San Diego in the last six months to suicide because in their business, you know, the hopeless helper business, when you can't help people anymore, that's like, you know, it's like a bad drain. It just clogs up and backs up. So it's incredible that we're leaving our veterans who have protected all of us and our comforts in this great country that we live in, we're leaving them behind, that where they should be put almost in front of the line. Just incredible to me that I'm well, I, 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 I don't even know if we're, we're leaving. They're just, not, it's not that they're being ignored. I think the people just assume, the people assume that they know what to do and they don't. Right. When you're, well, when you're, when you're in a level of depression or anxiety, you're not making smart decisions. You know, when I talk no. with families, they have a kid and they go, well, oh, they want to, they want to this and they want to that. I said, look, your child doesn't get a vote right now. They can vote about their next steps. Once we get the anesthesia removed and they're stabilized, but right now, if your kid's telling you they don't need to go to treatment and you tell me you just found 15 pills in their room yesterday and you found 20 the week before, they don't get a vote. I mean, they get to be involved with the conversation. I don't mean, you know, it's more it's more metaphorically, meaning listen to what they have to say, but let's don't let them dictate to you as a parent what they're going to do next, especially it's like this. If your neighbor's house was on fire, yeah. you wouldn't change the channel and go, honey, you know, <laughs> it's too cold to go out. You're going to make a phone call. You're going to call 911. You're going to throw a rock through their window. You just can't. And, you know, this disease of addiction is real similar. People are afraid. They don't know what to do. That's where the crisis coaching piece came in. So to answer that question, yeah. I just wanted people to know I'm, I'm not just a life coach. I, and I have a real specific and I, I help people with behavioral issues. I helped this really nice lady. She calls me two years ago. She says, my neighbor won't stop emailing me. She's 87 years old. She hmm. saw me in one of the Jewish Times articles. She goes, can you help me? And I said, well, tell me what's going on. I, you know, he emails me. I email him back. He just bothers me. Well, we walk out to the trash once a week. I see him and he won't stop emailing me. I said, are you responding to his email? She said, yes. I said, you know, you don't have to. She says, what? I said, stop responding to his emails. She calls me in a week and she said, oh my God, Scott, it worked. <laughs> and, and now we're friends again. I, I said, well, there you go. And you know, just what I can do that's different than say some people, well, I'm not the family. 
You know, right. I'm a neutral party. I'm like Switzerland. I'm like the, you know, the, I'm the uh, escrow officer. I'm the one in the middle. Mm. My, my, uh, my dog in the race is simply helping the family. And it's not many experts that really do that. There's usually a therapist for that one and a therapist for this one, or that one goes over here. But I try to get the whole family to coalesce. And, you know, in California, what, 54% of the families, you know, their, their relationships have ended up in divorce and a lot of them are bitter. So it's really hard to kind of get parents aligned on what to do next with, you know, their young child. Um, you know, the other morning I was listening to Howard Stern. I'm a native New Yorker, so I love Howard Stern. He's a big proponent of therapy. He's been in therapy a long time. And he had yeah. on a guy, a guy, a young guy named Machine Gun Kelly. Never, never, I'm not exposed to his music, but he had a story to tell, a fascinating backstory, one w- which was full of addiction and losing both of his parents and, and raising himself. And, and he talked about his best friend, Pete Davidson, who's another native New Yorker. And I did pick Pete Davidson's work, but Pete Davidson... Uh, came out and talked about his addiction problem recently. But Machine Gun Kelly went into the story about Pete was literally in a spiral and literally, as you said, out of his mind, because when you're in the throes of depression, addiction and everything else, when it all starts collapsing, you're not making rational decisions. And it was Machine Gun Kelly who then got him to a Malibu treatment center, which helped start turning things around, which leads me to the question is if smart people who have loads of dough have trouble accessing treatment or knowing what to do, why is it hard, so hard from rich to poor and everything in between to access treatment in this country when it shouldn't be, when this country is so democratized when it comes to information and everything else, what seemingly shouldn't be hard, why is it such a nightmare still? Well, accessing treatment actually is not that hard. What's really hard is the family. You okay. know, there's some there's some studies that have been done that says, okay. you know, early, earlier I talked about how, um, you know, there's a 95% relapse rate that takes place. And by the way, that relapse rate doesn't matter what program it is, whether it's mm. one of the anonymous programs like I go to, right. or, you know, some of the biggest, you know, DBT or CBDD, uh, whatever initials you want to put on it doesn't matter that if someone doesn't have a follow-up or a continuum of care, it's kind of like diabetes. You don't take insulin anymore and you've been diagnosed and your insulin levels go down, you're going to get sick and die. That's just simply how it goes. So what happens is with families they believe if they, you know, we can, we can love them to wellness. That doesn't work. And according to the studies, 75% of the people who relapse, 75%, it's usually triggered by family. For example, a guy goes through a treatment center, 28 days, comes home. Parents are like, okay, you got to get a job now. The same noise, if you will, I'm calling it noise. I don't mean to you know, judge anybody, but the same noise that that addict was hearing before is now being heard. And they've just spent 28 days working on trying to get sober and get clean and stay clean. That's their goal. I mean, most people, once they you know, go through that withdrawal and the pain, they don't really want to go back. It's not usually a conscious decision. So what happens is the family sometimes can get in the way in a big way. So to your point about, you know, when I've had calls from people in LA and they said, oh, the so-and-so, yeah, they're making $8 million a year now and they've got an agent and they've got this and they got that. I said, let's get everybody on the call because mm. if they're making that kind of money and they're doing that kind of parting and everyone's just getting out of their way because they don't want to step on their toes, trust me, they're all going to be going to their funeral. They're going to be going to their funeral because you just don't get well on your own, especially when it comes to self-medication. You know what I mean? Most people don't yeah. wake up one day and go, yeah. hey, John, you know what? I've decided I'm going to get as high as I can every day. See if I can end my life by taking right. something I'm not familiar with. I mean, Whitney Houston, she was on prescription medication. She does street drugs. And, you know, everything fell apart for her. Oh. And, and, you know, I don't even know all the issues behind it. And I'm, I'm basically quoting what I read in the newspaper, right, but it was, right. Dr., it was Dr. Drew, I think that got on, on the news for three days and he was so pissed off. He said, we know too much today to your point earlier about, you know, mm. people who had a lot of success at whatever yeah. level it might be. Right. And he said, we should do better. He said, but, and we said, people in the entertainment industry said, he said, they've been partying for years. But right now, people who are on prescribed medication, who are taking street drugs, he goes, there's not a lot of studies around this yet. You put those two things together, your body doesn't deal with it well. Mm. You know, and you see some of these stars who, you know, 
just think of Bellucci and just all of a sudden they're just gone. Now, you know, and, and we don't get to see the autopsy report and who knows, but according to what he said and, and what he knows, and he lives in that world, the uh, combination of street drugs with prescription medication and who knows what else, you know, it could be at too much Advil or something, but if you mix hmm. drugs and, and this was a few years ago. So today Tough. just having a, you know, what is it? The tiny piece of like a pin tip, a straight pin tip of fentanyl can kill you. That's oh, no. how, that's how small a dose it is. And keep in mind, you know, the, uh, I've got some close friends in the, the DEA. There's a guy that was busted a couple of years ago here in San Diego. And they asked him the question, why would you sell something that kills your customer? And his answer say? was, he said, every time there's an overdose, it makes the news. He goes, my business spikes. So I don't worry about it. So oh, that's my God. competition. That's that guy, that, that sling that's selling that stuff making that stuff, importing that stuff, distributing that stuff. I think of him as my competition and uh, I'm not afraid of him because I know that if I can, if I can cut off his distribution, yeah, yeah I, you know, cause that's what I used to do when I did drug and gang eradication, I would cut off the consumer and the distributor, you know, maybe come to me one day and go, yeah, Scott, I think I might have a problem. And that's, that's sometimes a way to wake people up and go, Hey, look, there's lots of different ways to make a living, but if you're going to do something that kills others every day, and you don't have a conscience, then you know, maybe we should talk about it. Because eventually what's going to happen, someone's going to take their business, which means they're going to take their life. And that kind of thing, you know, the, the survival mode is just, it's horrific. But right now with the, with the dark web, that scares me more than anything. Because even law enforcement, you know, you, it's so hard to find people on the dark web. Because that's what the dark web is about. And that's why it's IP called dark. Because they can't be traced. Yeah. Hey, if Scott, if you could change just one thing about society and had just your a great magic wand, what would it be right now? That's a great question. You know, I like to ask it as well because I think it's a great question. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I, I think probably, you know, I, I want to put education and prevention there, but I also want to make sure that that this conversation is as important, you know, as the weather reports, and and not necessarily put out in a way, but you know, we hear about the weather morning, noon, and night. You know, and we hear about things that, that are important and we hear about restaurant openings and we hear about traffic on the freeways. And, mm. and you know, we hear right now, a big thing is our schools opening, not opening, closing, you know. But at the end of the day, the conversation, we, you, you know, to your earlier question about stigma, it's just not a, a look. The fact that you and I are talking about this now, it's just pretty rare. I mean, I, I started my own podcast. There's a couple of them out there that talk about recovery, yeah. but not quite like this. You know, they, they no. it's mostly, you know, it's mostly 12 step based anonymous stuff. Yeah. And the thing, that, the thing that's difficult, and I'm a guy from, you know, way back from AA, and I get in trouble every time I say that publicly because, you know, the principles are you don't talk about it. But my attitude is, you know what? I think we need to stop keeping this a secret. I believe this yeah. anonymity, in my opinion, contributes to some of the stigma. Of course it does. 100%, you're yeah. right. Hey, you yeah. know, Scott, I mean, there's, here. there's, there's no, yeah, no, that's down. why I wanted to have you on, because I wanted it unvarnished. I wanted it from you, direct from you, you know, yeah. which leads me to my next question. You know, no, I, I know a lot of people, Scott, and I've had a blessed life in so many ways. And thank God I got clean myself and I'm 57 now. And, you know, I don't know anyone else like you who works day and night, literally. And, you know, again, you gave out your cell phone number. You told people anywhere in this great country, Seattle, New York, Long Island, Miami, uh, La Jolla and everyone in between. You can call Scott. You could text him. Nobody like you works day and night to help save lives. I've met tons of people in recovery and people who run mm -hmm. recovery centers. You're unlike others. I met you because when I first got well, I read your book. Tell me, tell me, no, I dare you. And, um, you know, talk a little bit about like the, the success of that book. And I know you have another book coming out. Talk a little bit about what your vision is and where you're going in terms of your next book. Well, you know, the, and the whole idea of tell me, no, I dare you is how to take a, a, a no and turn it into yes, because right. people who are, are behind the eight ball and people who are struggling and people who have been, you know, pigeonholed or people just think that, you know, they have low self-esteem or, and I learned all this when I talked to people coming out of jail and prison and homeless people, because, you know, once you cross that line, the feeling is I can't get back. You know, I can't vote again. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not part of society anymore. And, and I don't even have a skill. And I used to talk to, to especially the women, they were great. They go, I, I don't have any skills. I have three children. I just spent two years in county jail. I said, are you kidding? 
you have a skill of survival that's right. unparalleled. <laughs> you know, and the fact that your children are still here and your your mother's been taking care of them, you technically you still have an intact family. I said those are those are great skills. You're a great advocate. You're a good leader. Yeah. You're a supervisor. You're a chef. You're a homemaker. You're a transportation expert. And we used to put that on their resumes, and they'd get hired in a heartbeat. It was amazing. Awesome. So you know, for me, you know, in the next book, I'm real excited about it. And I was gonna have it was supposed to be coming out this month, and I pushed it back just because of what's going on, you know, obviously with the COVID and, you know, the, it's all about the opioid epidemic and that's, that's what it's called. And, and the idea of the book is to try to help families. And in that book are uh, probably close to 35 stories of individuals who have had loved ones. Some of them have lost loved ones and it's their stories. So hopefully when the, when the book gets out and, and it's probably going to be January, families will be able to pick it up and go, now I know what to do. Okay. So it's basically, it's, it's kind of like a GPS or a navigational tool, which falls into my family navigator piece. So it, it's going to help families understand that, first of all, they're not alone. Second of all, it's not their fault. Thirdly, it's a disease. And fourthly, there's hope and there's help. And last of all, I need help are three of the toughest words. But when you express them, generally there's somebody in the room will go, I had no idea. How can I help? But if nobody knows, part of the stigma, if nobody knows you need help, they don't know how to help you. Wow, that's awesome. And listen, for our listeners out there, Scott, I'm so grateful for your time today. And I want you to come back when the new book comes out. For our listeners out there that want to reach Scott and the important and great work, and you want him to save a loved one's life for your life, please go to uh, www.yourcrisiscoach.com. You could call him or text him 24 7 at 619 993 2738. 619 993 2738. Scott Silverman, you're just a unique and special human being, saving lives, making the world a better and safer place. I'm so grateful for our friendship. I'm so grateful for the work that you do. And I can't wait to have you back on the Impact Podcast. Thank you again. Thank you, John. Really appreciate it. 